Praise the Lord, church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in here this morning. We thank the Lord for all of his blessings upon us. He's been so good to us. We thank you, Jesus, for your mercies, God, for your grace, God, for your love, and for your kindness, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God, in the name of Jesus, God. You're so worthy, God, to be praised. We thank you, God, that we're in the house here this morning, God, to worship and to praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings on us. Thank you, Jesus. Well, this morning, I guess, is our Christmas Sunday, since we won't be here next week. Just a reminder, since next week is Christmas Day, next Sunday, we won't be here. So this is our Christmas Sunday. So due to that, I decided to keep it a little in the Christmas spirit, and I skipped the lesson that was going to be for this week and moved on to the Christmas Sunday lesson in your Sunday school book. And that lesson is titled, Worshiping with Shepherds and Wise Men. So today we're going to start at our focus verse in Matthew 2 and 11. And it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the lesson text is in Luke 2, starting at verse number 15. And it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even into Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them according, uh, concerning this child. Sorry, and, they, and all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. So today, the truth about God is God came to be accessible to everyone, to everyone. And the truth of my life is I will worship God no matter my station in life. And I looked up that word station. In other words, it means your social rank or your position in life. So no matter if you're rich or poor, sick or well, you should worship God no matter what. So before you're seated this morning, turn to your neighbor, tell them that you're awake and you're ready to praise and worship the Lord this morning. <laughs> Are y'all really awake this morning? Because <laughs> I'm definitely excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in this place here today. So you may be seated. <clears throat> so if anybody, if anybody didn't know, Christmas is in seven days. I'm sure unless you live underneath a rock somewhere, you know that Christmas is just right around the corner. Everywhere you look, you can see that Christmas is near. You see commercials advertising things that you should get or give people. There's billboards. Every time you probably go on Facebook or anywhere, there's probably some type of ad for Christmas. Um, Hallmark is starting to play their Christmas movies. The Wolford House Dinner Theater is doing their Christmas show. Ramey Ford Sales Group is begging you to buy a car for Christmas to help their end the year sales. Go see Larry J. And um, Sister Judy, I bet QVC has tons of great Christmas gifts going on right now. Everywhere. So, if you need anything, Sister Judy says QVC has sales like crazy. So every store you go in is packed with people running around trying to get what they need for Christmas. Buying gifts upon gifts. You can feel it everywhere you go. But through all the hustle and bustle of Christmas time, we can't forget about Jesus. The real reason for this season that we're in 
It's not about a jolly fat man in a red suit giving out presents, but if he was real, I hope he gives me something. But that our God loved us enough, that he loved us enough to come down in the form of flesh as the greatest gift ever and give us a way to salvation, to save us from our sin, to show love to all of us, not just the rich and the powerful that the world likes to flock to, but he came down on Christmas Day, born of the flesh, to love all people. So the birth of Jesus is not just a good story to read every year at Christmas, but is a story that we should keep in our hearts year round. The birth of Jesus was an event that changed the world forever. After that day, nothing would ever be the same again. So in, the, in your Bible, that time in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's called the 400 years of silence. It was that time that the Lord didn't openly speak to his people. I'm sure he probably still did things for people, but they were used to the prophets and other men of God, God speaking through them, them speaking to the people. That wasn't openly done during that time. To me, that would be very hard to imagine. Because me, I hate missing just one service, Sunday service, that we don't get to hear the preached word of God, which is that same thing, God giving a message to the man of God to give to us. So 400 years of silence whew, be a rough, rough time. But, like we always say, but. But then the silence was broke on that very first Christmas day. And it was broken by the sound of a baby's cry. The whole world was going to change after that moment, at that first cry of baby Jesus. Now the creator, the very creator of all heaven and earth, was now just born in the flesh, was going to be walking around the earth in flesh and bone. This was not just any event. This was an earth-changing event. Never would be the same again event. An event that was going to set up something great, not just for the Jewish people, but something for the whole world. So just mentioning that Jesus was born, that should be enough to make us want to shout and worship right there. Just knowing that our, that our Savior came down. He didn't have to do it, but He came down in flesh for us. He did this because He loved us that much. He came to change it all. No more having to find an animal without spot, without wrinkle, and go do a certain ceremony to get your sins taken away, to blot them out. But now the blood... The very blood that was going to cover all sins was born on the earth on Christmas Day. The one that would end up accepting us, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, into this great salvation was born that day. He didn't send an angel to do it. He didn't raise up another great man like he did Moses to help out the people to do this. The Lord himself came down. And that makes Jesus the ultimate Christmas gift ever. The very best gift. The gift that is worth waiting in any long line for. The gift that is worth fighting the crowds for. The gift that is worth the price you have to pay to get it. In Matthew chapter 13, verse number 44, uh, we find this story. And it talks, I just wanted to read this one verse here. It said, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hidden in a field. The which, when a man hath found it, he hideth it. And for great joy goeth and selleth all everything that he had and buyeth that one field because of what he found there. It was worth the price. We just have to get our minds off the things of the world and onto the kingdom of God. And we will see, just like this man who found that treasure, that nothing else matters. We get your mind on the kingdom of God, you'll see nothing else else matters. It will be worth every penny, every dime that you got to spend to get it. It will be worth what you have to give up to get it. Giving up all is just a small price to pay for what you will get in return when you go to Jesus, because Jesus is worth it. Right. Worth the different lifestyle that you'll have to live. Right. Worth all the criticism that you might receive for living for Jesus. It will be worth it all. Because of the birth of Jesus, we have salvation today. We have that promise of eternity in heaven with Jesus in our heavenly home. Mark 10 and 21, it says this, Then Jesus, he beholding, him, uh, beholding him, he loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, 
Sell whatever thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus, he ended up taking up his cross for us. So today I'm asking, are you willing, are we all willing to take up our cross and follow him? Because like I said, when that silence was broken on that very first Christmas day, the world changed. Now we have to make up the choice, our own choice, to either worship the world or to worship Jesus. We have that choice today. Are we going to worship him? Are we going to give him all of the praise day in and day out for all the great things that he's done for us, for the great salvation that he's done for us, for loving us, for the healing that he has brought to our body, for, for giving us a chance to spend eternity in, for him, in heaven with him, for all that he's done for us. Are we going to be willing Amen. to give it all up, to give up everything else, take up the cross and follow him? Because let me tell you, Jesus is that gift that just keeps on giving. The gift that will give you the joy unspeakable. It says it'll give you joy unspeakable. The gift that will give you peace, a peace inside when there's nothing, else, when everything seems crazy and there's nothing to give you peace, Jesus can give you that peace to overcome everything. Because the gift of Jesus is the greatest gift we could ever get. And it is the gift that we need to share to the world. We don't need to keep that gift to ourselves. So we need to worship Jesus. And when you look in Webster, Webster defines worship as this, to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power. But I love the next one. It says to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. I love that definition. To regard with great or extravagant respect or honor. Because do you know what extravagant means? It basically means lacking restraint. Lacking restraint. We're to worship our God lacking any restraint. Lacking any restraint out. To not hold anything back, but to give it all. Every bit of us. To, do, to worship as much as we can and then go oh, more into that. To worship in excess. Lacking no restraint with our worship. Sounds like David, right? When he brought the uh, Ark of the Covenant back in there. So he danced like a crazy person. Even his wife looked at him and said, man, you were crazy. Lacking no restraint. That's how we're supposed to worship Jesus. Our love for Jesus coming down on Christmas Day to make a way for us to be saved should make us want to worship with excess. Worship Him with all of our hearts, holding nothing back, giving it all to Jesus, that greatest gift ever. So today we're going to talk about the story of the birth of Jesus and how it shows us the ways we should respond to Jesus the very worship that you see in the Christmas story alone. And first we're going to start with the shepherds in Luke 2, 7 through 8. It says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Here our Savior was born. Jesus was just born. The King of Kings was born, and they laid him in a manger. Not born in some royal palace like a king would be, but the creator of the whole world just came down in the form of flesh in such a humble way. But just so happened that nearby in a field, there was a group of shepherds watching over their sheep. They were doing their job. And you have to remember, in ancient Israel, shepherds were not high up on the social rank. They were mostly considered unclean because of the work that they did. They spent their days in contact with dirty, smelly, stinky sheep. They weren't probably the most clean people. Probably had bugs buzzing around them. Cuts and scrapes from dealing with the animals, living out in the wild like that. They probably weren't the people that the priests and the religious people would want coming into the house to worship God, to come into God's presence, treated mostly like outsiders. But that was all going to change. This night was not going to be like all the other nights the shepherds were out in the field watching their sheep. Luke 2, 9-14. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you, <clears throat> excuse me, 
good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be the sign unto you, that you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. An angel came down, came to these lowly shepherds to tell them of the birth of Jesus. They got to witness this heavenly host of, of angels praising God that day. All of this for a group of people low on the social ranking scale. The angel didn't come and visit the religious leaders, the priests of that time. Did not come to them to tell them this great news. But they came to these unclean shepherds out in the field. And if you look at that, just like the night, that night, throughout all of Jesus' lifetime, he was always open to welcoming people that were thought to be unclean or even unwelcomed by the religious leaders, the ones that should have been loving him, should have been caring for him. Jesus showed love and compassion to the outsiders. He would make the religious types mad by healing the lepers, eating with tax collectors, hanging out with the low social class people. That's, how, that's what happened. And here, these shepherds were going to be the very first ones to see the creator of all, the God of the whole universe, the Savior being born in flesh and blood that day. And why I'm pointing this out today is to tell you that Jesus loves you, that Jesus loves you. Jesus will accept you. So don't feel like your past, like your sins that you've done in your past, that it will make it to where God won't love you, that God won't accept you in because you are worthy of God's attention. Because you are here, because Jesus came down on Christmas Day just as much for you as for everyone else. That's why we need to put away our shame, put away our guilt. Don't let it be what stops you from seeking after the Lord and getting closer to the Lord because Jesus loves you today. That is the miracle of Christmas. That God was willing to pay the price so that all who are willing to come to Him can come to Him. We can all worship Jesus no matter our past or the situations that we're going through in our life right now. Because if we seek after Jesus, if we seek after Him, He will accept us unto Him. So what did the shepherds do when they got that visit from the angel? We see that in Luke 2 and 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the shepherds said unto one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which the Lord, which this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. So the shepherds, they didn't sit around. They didn't discuss it. Oh, look at what we've seen, you know. Uh, well, we're, we're not really religious leaders, but, you know, we're, we're just smelly old shepherds. We can't leave our job here. we got to watch the sheep. We have too much to do. Well, maybe I need to do this first or that first before I go and see what the angels showed us. No, it said they were filled with excitement. They were so much excitement inside. And they said, let's go. Let's go. They went with haste. They went to find Jesus. And when they did, they were amazed. They didn't keep it to themselves after they seen it. They ran probably through the whole town. Anybody they find, I can imagine they're probably knocking on doors telling people, you know what just happened? The angels came down. The Messiah is here. They praised. They worshiped Jesus. They gave it all that they could. They were probably so excited at that point. That visit from the angels made them all agree to leave their flocks, leave all the sheep out there and go and worship. And that should be an example to us today. If we want to come to Jesus and be all that Jesus wants us to be, we might just have to be like the shepherds and leave some things behind. Leave some things and go to Him. To be able to truly worship God for all that He is, we will have to leave things behind to be able to get close to Him. 
Because we can't be full of the world and try to serve and worship Jesus because it will not work. There'll be too much junk, too much stuff in our way to fully worship Jesus for who he is. And we can see this concept from the very beginning in the Bible. When Abraham was told to leave his home and go to the place the Lord would lead him to. Because Abraham, he was living where all of his family was at, where all of his friends were at. I'm sure he was comfortable living there. This is probably the place he grew up in, where his life was at. But God told him to pack up, told him to move away, to leave all of that behind. That he would make a great nation out of him. And Abraham, obeying that call to leave, leave it all behind and go where God was leaving him, that was a form of worship. It was a form of worship. It showed Abraham love, had a love for God. That Abraham had a devotion to God to be able to give up even his homeland to go to a place that God sent him. In our own lives, we might, have, we might be called to leave some things behind as a form of worship. To show Jesus that we truly love him and that he means everything to us, we might have to give some things up. And it might be very hard. He may make us give up something that's very hard to give up. But sometimes we are called to do hard things. Things that we never choose to do on our own. Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 3, it says this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God should always be the first in our lives. Over all the other stuff of this world... And the stuff we might be asked to leave behind is what we might have made those little g-gods in our lives. The jobs that we may put as a higher priority in, in front of Jesus. It may be the success that we're looking for, that we're willing to do things that we shouldn't to be able to give it. And we all know that money is another thing that if we focus too much on it, can take us over and become another god in our lives. So there's certain things we may have to give up to get before him because we need no other gods before him. Amen. Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none but good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said in him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt uh, not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, probably excitedly, all these things I've kept from my youth. What else do I lack? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when that young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He had so much. This man, he had it all. It says he had great possessions. He was a rich young man. And he wasn't a bad guy. He couldn't have been a bad guy. He had followed all the commandments that he was told from the law of Moses to follow. He had followed those. He was probably a good person. He, he even called Jesus good master. So he knew somewhat, a little few things of who Jesus was. And all, and all he wanted was to know what else. What else do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus gave him that answer. said, this is how you can get even closer to me than you are right now. This is what you have to do. This is what you need to do to have eternal life. Sell all you have. Give it to the poor, and that will put you a little bit of treasure up in heaven, and then come, follow me. He was giving him a chance that day to have a deeper form of worship, and that man turned it down because he was not willing to give up what he had for Jesus. It was too big of a cost in his eyes, too big of a cost for that man to have the relationship that Jesus was offering. He was offering a deeper worship, a deeper relationship, but the gods said the cost was way too much. The shepherds, they left all to go see Jesus. The disciples gave up all to follow after Jesus. We might have to give up things to get closer to Jesus, to get that deeper relationship. 
Because we can't live and act the same way as the people we see at work. We can't. We can't do the same things the people the world do and serve and worship Jesus. It will not work. And sadly, and very sadly, sometimes we can't do some of the things their own family members do. Because, because that will lead us away from Jesus. That's sad sometimes to think that you may have to separate yourself a little bit from some of your family members. Because it will pull you away from Jesus. But sometimes we've got to do stuff to get closer to Jesus. Luke 14 and 26, it says this, If any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It's a very hard saying. He gives us such a hard saying here. But Jesus is not really saying it in the way of, you know, hating people like we think about it. But he's saying if you don't love Jesus, if you don't have that love for Jesus more than, more than you for your own family, more than your own self, he said you can't be my disciple because it takes something more to have that deep, close relationship with Jesus. It takes a little bit of work because to truly worship him, we must be willing to give up everything and anything that we have to that would get in our way of serving Jesus. The shepherds that night on Jesus' birth were poor, lowly men, so they didn't have anything that they could bring to this newborn king. They didn't have something that, but they did have something they can leave behind to come and worship him. And they were ready and they were willing to give up all to go worship the Savior, to go worship the Christ, their coming Messiah. Because the Jews from the law of Moses, all the way back in Deuteronomy 6 and 5, it tells them that thou shalt love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all their might. The, the Israelites, they were taught that from birth. They were taught to love God more than anything else. So the shepherds that, they, that night may not have had these great gifts to bring to the Savior of the world, but they showed us the very importance of bringing, presenting our own selves as gifts of worship to the one that is due all worship. That it should be ourselves sometimes that we got to bring before Jesus for worship, presenting ourselves. So are we willing to give ourselves as a gift of worship to the Lord for, because of all that he's done for us? The come into the house of the Lord and lift up a joyful noise, the praise the Lord, the clap, the shout, to do all this stuff, to give ourselves as a gift of worship to the God who's done so much for us. Because Jesus is calling for us all to come and worship him. Those who are rich, those who are poor, those who feel like they have it all, no problems in the world, and those that have problems all over. Maybe in sickness is going on, we're all called to come and to worship God, our Savior. Because we should be able to praise and worship our Lord and Savior no matter what. No matter what situations come our way, in the good times, in the bad times. We need to give ourselves our time, our attention, and all of ourselves as a gift of worship to the Lord of all. We owe Him that much. Even if problems come our way, we owe Him enough to say, thank you, Jesus. I know it may be an issue. I may have problems. I may have sicknesses. But thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your grace upon me, for your healing power, because I know that you will bring me through it. So there was another group that night that came to worship Jesus after his birth. And it's, we read that in Matthew 2, verse number 1, where it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. I, just, I was thinking about this scripture this morning. I thought how brave these wise men must have been to go into uh, to King Herod and say, hey, where's the, where's the person who's born king of the Jews? You know, a little bravery there. But So now these wise men, they didn't get to be there on that night that Jesus was born, like the shepherds did. It was probably around two years after the birth of Jesus before they actually seen the king of the Jews that they were coming to find. But unlike the shepherd, these wise men, they were wealthy men. They, they had wealth. So they didn't come empty-handed 
And that tells us there's another way that we should approach the Lord to worship. That when we come to Jesus, we should bring gifts that tell Jesus we know who He is and we desire to give Him the worship that He is worthy of. Matthew 2 and 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. And immediately they fell down and worshipped him. And, they had, and when they had opened up their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The very first thing these wise men, these Gentiles did, they weren't even Jewish, these were Gentiles did, when they saw Jesus was they fell down, they worshipped him. That should be what we, the first thing that comes to our heart, first thing that comes to our minds when we get into the presence of the Lord is to come in to worship, to fall down and say, thank you, Jesus. It should be the first thing that we think of to worship the God of all. We should have that heart to just want to worship the Lord for who He is. If we truly knew who God is and we remember what He has done for us, it should not be a hard thing to be able to worship Him, to be able to say, thank you, Jesus, for bringing me out of the darkness into the marvelous light. It should be inside of us. That brother Coleman, when he steps into the door back there and you see him throw up his fist because he's excited to be in the house of the Lord. We should have that worship inside of us. When they came to him, after they praised him, they gave him gifts. These gifts, probably without the wise men even fully knowing what they were giving him, it was going to reflect the character of who Jesus was and what he would end up doing for us all. They brought him gold. The gold would represent his royalty. But more than what the wise men thought, because they thought of him as the king of the Jews, because he was even more than that. He was the king of all kings. They brought him to him frankincense. And frankincense, it's like a aromic incense. And this would represent his divinity, that he was God in the flesh. And then there was myrrh. Myrrh was a perfume that was used during the embalming process during that time. This gift could have been a prophetic gift that they didn't even know about. That he was one day going to sacrifice himself, suffer for all humanity, so we would have a chance to be saved. These gifts was the way the wise men worshipped Jesus. And it was based off of the God-given revelation of who he was. That he was king. They used these gifts as a way of worship based on what they knew about Jesus. So today, we are called to worship God with gifts. And I know what you're thinking. Brother Thomas, are you saying that we got to come in here with literal gifts, lay it down in front of the altar to worship the Lord? Not at all. But we do have gifts that we can bring Jesus today. We can, the first gift we can bring Him is the rest of our lives. Making Jesus the King of kings of our lives. Giving Him ourselves. Not just the leftovers after we get done doing everything else that we want to do in that five seconds before you close your eyes and go to sleep at night, but give Him our whole selves, every bit of ourselves. We can bring Him our desires. Letting Jesus know that we don't want to live our lives based on what just makes us happy, but we want to start letting our desires be based on what makes Jesus happy, making the Lord happy, our desire to be, make Jesus happy. We can bring Him our love as a gift to Him, our love for Jesus first and foremost, but also a love for others, a love for lost souls, a love to see souls saved. We can bring that as a gift to Him. We can bring Jesus our faith as a gift. Our faith to trust Him in the good times and also in the bad times. Our faith to know that in Him, that whatever happens, if we're walking with Jesus, our faith to know that whatever happens, that it's going to be okay. Because we are know we are walking in the, in the will of the Lord. Knowing that all things will work out to our good because we are walking inside of Him. No matter what the situation will be. That faith that keeps us going day in and day out. <clears throat> we can bring Him our lives and even the lives of our own family. We can give our family into His hand knowing that He's able to do the work. We can bring Him our finances knowing that if we leave that up to Jesus, 
We will always have the money for what we need. Give him our families. Give him our finances. We should feel like we can trust Jesus to bring him everything in our life. Bring him our future. Bring him even our hobbies. Our health should be given to him. The creator of our bodies, the great physician is who he is. So who better to give your health into than the one who created your body? The great physician, who better to put it in the hand? So we have so much we can give Jesus. And when we do, when we give that over to Jesus, it is a form of worship. It is showing that we trust him. It is showing that we have a love for him. That we have made him Lord over our lives. That we believe he is the King of kings. That he is the Lord of lords. And that there is none like him. We need to come to Jesus and leave all the sin of this world behind. Leave worldliness behind. Get rid of the sinful habits. Get rid of the worldly addictions that we've put inside of our lives. Things that steal all of our time so we have nothing to give to the Lord. Because when we do those actions, we show Jesus that we love him. And we have a desire to please him. It is a form of worship. It is our gift that we can bring to Jesus. Because we can never pay Jesus back for what he has done for us. There's no way to give back for all the things that God has done for us. We can never end up being good enough to deserve what he does for us. If you're waiting to become worthy, good enough to serve Jesus, then it's never going to happen. You need to do it now. Serve him now. Give your life over to him as a gift and go to and try to serve Jesus the best that you can. But what we can do is give him worship he deserves. We may not be able to have much great stuff, but we can give God the worship he deserves. We can give him all of ourselves, every single bit of him, of ourselves. <clears throat> we worship like the shepherds when we leave all of our sinful past, when we leave our world, worldly ways behind. We submit ourselves to the will of the Lord in our lives. When we do our repentance, our baptism in Jesus' name, when we do this stuff, we give ourselves to Him. We decide to leave it all behind. That gives, that's us worshiping like the shepherds did that day. We worship like the wise men when we bring Jesus gifts of faith, gifts of trust and obedience, showing the Lord that we trust Him and that we submit our lives over to Him. When we put all of our desires, hopes, and dreams, and futures into God's hands. We worship like the wise men did. Because their worship is what Jesus deserves. And I'm going to come to close here today. The kids are back there. But on that first Christmas day, when the cry of baby Jesus broke the 400 years of silence, it has never been silent since. Because now, where the people of the Lord is at, where you guys, the people of the Lord are at, wherever the ones that worship and serve the Lord is at, all we have to do is cry out in praise and worship, in prayer, and the Lord will heal us, hear us. He will hear us. Because the Lord we serve, the very Lord that you serve today, I promise you, He hears your prayers. He hears your cries of help. And when He does, the Lord answers us. The Lord delivers us, and the Lord will speak to us. If we are not silent, and we go to the King of Kings, then I promise you, the Lord, if we go to Him in praise, if we go to Him in worship, if we don't go silently, if we come to Him in prayer and fasting, God will answer you today. Jesus will answer your prayer. He will make a way somehow. Because Jesus is everything that we need. Through all your good times and bad times in your life, just quickly think about that. All the things that you went through in your life, can you see during those times where the Lord was with you? where the Lord brought you out, where things could have been worse than it was, but the Lord did a work for you. Do you have something today, church, to praise and worship Jesus for? I know I do. I have plenty to be able to lift up my hands and praise and worship the Lord for because he has been so, so good to me. And God and the Lord, he is worthy of it all. He's worthy of every bit of praise that we can give him because I want my whole life to show that God is good. I want every bit of my life to show, and I don't want to miss those opportunities to raise my hand and say thank you, Jesus, to give him a little bit of action. and Because I want my words and my actions to show Jesus is worthy of all praise and worship, that he alone is all that we need. So church, we need to choose to serve the Lord and worship him. 
Not just every year when December rolls around and Christmas time is in the air, but we need to choose and worship Him every day of our lives. Live like it is Christmas time year round. So don't forget, church, this Christmas, the greatest gift ever won't be underneath a Christmas tree. The greatest gift ever came from heaven down to earth. That gift changed the world forever. That gift paved the way for us to be saved. If you want to share a gift with your friends, with your family, that will keep on giving, then share the gift of Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate gift. Give Jesus, our Savior, all the worship that he deserves today. God bless. Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you very much.
do this one again. No music. Silent night. Holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round yon virgin mother. I take y'all caroling with me anytime. Help us with these two.
it on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Shepherds fear and tremble when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Down in the lonely manger, our humble Christ was born. And God made His salvation on that blessed Christmas morn. And He said, oh, go tell it on the mountain over the gift that we need. Can we offer him 30 seconds of praise this morning? Can we lift our hands up? Can we thank him that he came down, that he was that ransom that we didn't have to pay, that he was that gift, that he was the light of the world, that he was the salvation, that he is our everything, that he was that perfect gift. Lord, we praise you, God, and we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your birth, your death, your resurrection. We thank you for everything you've done for us. Lord, we praise you, God. We worship you, God. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And brothers, I don't know if y'all can hear back there, but I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here. We got you. Um, now, listening to, to Brother Thomas's lesson already, I was going through my notes back there in the first five minutes. All I could say was, well, uh, I take it as a sign, you know, from the Lord that we're, we're, we're sinking in here. But you also may hear some of the same points again. So just so y'all know, everything comes from the Lord. It's not from us. It's from him. So if y'all could take your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 through 7. Isaiah 53, 2 through 7. And these are tough to get through sometimes. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. 
He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one, uh, one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. Amen. If you go to Luke 1, 31 through 33. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Amen. He shall be great, and he shall be called the son of the highest. Yeah. And the Lord Amen. God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And the last scripture is Matthew 1 and 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Thank you, Jesus. So today... I'd like to speak just a, a few minutes with the help of the Holy Ghost on this thought, born for a purpose. Brother John, if you wouldn't mind praying for us, please. In Jesus' name, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> and y'all, forgive me, and online viewers, forgive me as well. We're on week four of whatever this junk is going around that I caught from the schools. But hopefully, as Pastor said, we'll get it out of here before Christmas. That's right. He shall save his people from their sins. When Christ was born... He was born with a specific purpose to fulfill. I believe it was Brother Spear last week was talking and he mentioned David. And he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that we deserve this perfect sacrifice? And the answer is something I don't believe our small minds can comprehend. We experience the vastness of God's unending love all the time. But understanding God's love is something completely different. Raise your hand real quick if you would want to pay off all of my debts that I have. I don't see many hands going up. You can see how big of a fight it is right now with the, the student loan forgiveness. And you've got people like me that want it because I have student debt. But then you've got some people who don't have the debt, and they're getting a little bit agitated because they don't want to foot the bill for me and my decisions that I did. Larry J., would, would you offer to call Capital One at any time to pay off my truck right now? No. He's shaking his head no. <laughs> I don't see too many people raising their hands to agree to that. And I'll ask y'all why not. Because for the past few weeks, it's been preachers. We are family, right? <laughs> That's what we've heard. That was the message. Where's the love? Where's the love for my family that y'all don't want to carry my debts? You see, we love each other and we do a lot of things for one another. But we don't want to pay the price for someone else's mistakes. We don't want to pay the price for someone else's debts. Brother David goes and robs a bank. I'm not going to serve jail time for you, brother. No, I love you to pieces. I'll text you. I love you. I'll do all kinds of stuff. But I ain't going to serve jail time for you because that's your decision. That's your fault. It ain't mine. Larry J. ain't going to pay off my truck, and I ain't going to pay off his because I know in six months it's going to be traded away anyway. <laughs> Is different. He sees our faults. He saw our faults from the very beginning. He knew all our sins, yet he loved us then, and he continues to love us now. <laughs> First Peter 1, 18 through 20 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, 
both the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Foreordained, that means he was predestinated. Amen. God knew before the foundation of the world, before Adam and Eve were even here, before he even said the words, let there be light, let there be anything, before he created the heavens and the earth, he knew that he would have to come down and be that perfect sacrifice, that he would have to redeem us from our sins. Paul would go on to write later in the New Testament, so that he was made to be sin for us, even though he knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus would say that he came not to be ministered unto, but he came to minister. Right. That he also came to be a ransom for many. He came to pay that price of redemption. That's what ransom means there in the Bible, a redeeming price. So again, before there was anything, man was on God's mind. He loved us before we were even right. created. And, and how can we fathom that? Now, I know Jared and Anna, they talked about having kids before and whatever, and I love Miles, but I really couldn't love another kid because it wasn't here. But now that the baby's on the way, I'm experiencing that same kind of love because it's already here. I really couldn't love it a whole lot before it was created. I couldn't grasp the concept of another one. But God works differently than we do. He works in the present, and he works in the future, he works in the past, he works at all times. And before there was anything... He thought about me, and he thought about you, and he thought about hanging on that cross. He knew he'd have to be despised, rejected, smitten, mocked, that he would suffer beatings, that he would have to hang on the cross just so we could be redeemed, even though we didn't even exist. As the song says, he suffered it all because he loved me. And again, I can't comprehend that level of love, but that's just how God is. His love knows no limit. It was hard for man to live underneath the old law. There was hundreds and hundreds of commandments. It was tough not to mess up. And from the beginning, God knew that he would always have a new covenant with us, a separate covenant with us. But he also knew that there had to be a price that had to be paid for that covenant. And he knew that there was only one person that was capable of paying that price, and that was him. He's the only one that could fit that or foot that bill and pay that check. Last week, we talked about Jesus being the good shepherd, and how he said that there's another flock that he needed to bring into the fold. That's us as Gentiles. And before he brought us into the fold, we had no chance at this thing until Jesus was born, until he hung on that cross for us. Now, in an instant, God, in his vastness and his awesomeness and his, his power, he could have just spoken the words and said, guys, go ahead and let the Gentiles in. He could have opened that door wide open. The law, my covenant, all the blessings, everything can be poured out upon the Gentiles. But that's not how God operates. Because he has the power. He can move mountains. He can do lots of things. He can harden hearts. He can soften hearts. He can do whatever he wants to. But God has a special kind of love. He has that agape love. Love that's unending and love that's in action. And God likes to show us his love in action. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because he wants us to show in action just how far his love can reach, that it really knows no bounds. And what's a better option for showing just how deep and how far your love can go than hanging on the cross, than being that perfect sacrifice for the people of the world? He didn't have to be born and dwell among us. There was no obligation. It wasn't written. It was, he wasn't bound to anything. But it was his choice. And again, going back to last week's lesson, we talked about how God told Israel that they would see the breach of his promise. Now, God is always faithful on his end of promises. It's always man that breaks their end. And once we break our end, that's the end of the contract. He's not bound unless it's by his mercy and grace and he continues to want to do things. But almost from day one, man has been unfaithful to God. We've been rebellious to God. You go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, they had it made. We could all be living in paradise. We could be living it up. No work, no problems, no nothing. But they, they listened to the serpent. They had everything put out in front of them. And God said, just one thing, don't do this. And what's the one thing they go to do? They go and eat the fruit. And then they ruin it. They blow it all to pieces for everyone else. And it just keeps getting worse and worse through times. Gentiles are out there living it up. They're serving their false God. They're enjoying all the sin that this world has to offer. 
And you think God's people, Israel, would be different. Sometimes yes, but most of the time, no. We all know the roller coasters of ups and downs that they had, how they defiled the temple. You look at early in Josiah's reign. When he's moved, he begins cleaning out the temple. They begin doing the repairs and everything. And they stumble upon the book of the law. It says that they found the book of the law. It had to be found. Not even the king or the high priest knew its location in the temple. That would be like Dwayne coming in here and not being able to find the Bible. That would be pitiful. That would be sad. But that's the shape that Israel had found themselves in during those days. You go all the way back to Exodus. God brings them out of bondage. And within a couple days, they go right to complaining. They see a little bit of trouble. They come to the Red Sea, and they're like, oh, did you bring us out here to die? Oh, that it was better that we lived in Egypt. Sure, we were under bondage, but at least we had some good stuff back then. And that just keeps building from there, the murmuring, the complaining, the rebellion. And it keeps going all the way till they build the golden calf. And there's more and more idol worship. There's more and more sins. And God gets to the spot that he wants to wipe them all out and start over. And I don't blame God one bit. But with every generation, sin just grew and grew, and God gave chance after chance after chance. But sin continued to grow and to grow. You had people sacrificing their kids to Moloch through fire. You had the worship of Baal and the Canaanite gods. They set up groves, and I'm not going to go into all the messed up stuff that was involved there. They even allowed the Sodomites to live right beside the temple. That's how bad the nation had gotten, how far they had shifted away from God. And we've had many lessons talking about how God gave him chance after chance. But eventually God got to that point when he said, you're going to know my breach of promise. And he said, you're done as a nation. This is when God wipes Judah and he wipes Israel off the map because they stiffened their neck and they wouldn't turn and hearken unto what God said. And then as Brother Thomas talked about for about 400 years, you really don't hear much. Not much is recorded. But here's another example of how God's love differs from ours. If somebody keeps wronging us over and over again, if somebody makes us mad, we'll just cut them out. We're done. We're done with them in our lives. People will go long periods of time wanting nothing to do with, with, with someone that's wronged them. Even over the smallest and the pettiest of things, we're just ready in an instant to cut people out. And if God wanted to cut man off right there, he had every right to do that, to just be done with us. Be up there with the angels, let man do what they wanted to do until they finally destroyed themselves. And we talk a lot about the, the world being a wicked, wicked place today, and, and we see a lot of things, but it was pretty bad back then too. If you go back to, to when they came out of Egypt, and their estimates, it, it varies, because I know the Bible lists it's like 506,000 soldiers, people, men on foot, and then you had the multitude, and, and all mixed in. So roughly one to two million people came up out of Egypt. And between the Exodus and the time of the prophet Elijah, there was a, a space, depending on where you date the Exodus, of four to 500 years. And probably safe to assume that the populations of Israel and Judah went up at that time. But for the sake of being very, very conservative, let's just say the population stayed at two million people. And when Elijah's now on the run from Jezebel after, after he'd done slain the prophets of Baal, and he feels all alone, he feels like he's the only one serving God. God tells him, he says, I have set aside 7,000 people who have not kissed Baal, who have not fallen under Baal. Amen. And that's sad. That's 7,000 people out of 2 million. That's 0.35% of the people were still serving God. Uh, the original number that was brought out of Egypt, 99.65% of the people had given up on God. If you added, the, you did those percentages with the number of people in America now, you'd have maybe 1.2 million people in church. You'd have close to 330 million people out living how they want to live. Think about how wicked those times were back then. But yet God still didn't give up on his people. He is that agape love, that unending love that he gives us a chance after chance after chance. And it got to a point where it was so bad when it was time for Israel to be wiped out and it was time for, for Judah and the kingdoms to be wiped out that if you looked, you had the kings, the princes, the priests, the men of God, 
all the way down to the commoners, were all involved in idol worship. They were involved in sin. They were involved in all the things, the abominations that God hated. And then we get to 400 years of nothing being recorded. This is what they call the Hellenistic period when Alexander the Great and the Greeks and all that take over. But nothing is recorded in our Bible. And like Thomas said, does that mean God was silent? No. He was probably still talking to people. But there was no nation of Israel at that time. And if you're a first-time reader to the Bible, you might think that God threw in the towel on man. But he was just actually waiting. And as we often talk about, even though when we don't see it, God's still working. Amen. 400 years, we don't hear much, but God's still pulling some strings and working some stuff out. <coughs> oh, Jesus. In Galatians, it talks about heirs. And I, I think we read some of these scriptures again last week. I guess the Lord's wanting us to remember a few things. And, and Paul is talking about, he said that if an heir is a child... He's no different than a servant, even though he be Lord of all. That he's under tutors, he's under governors, until the Father appoints a time for him not to be under those things. Until the Father decides it's time for him to come be an actual heir. In Galatians 4 and 3, it says that even when we were children, we were in bondage to the elements of this world. We were bound, we were tied down to the things of this world. And like I said earlier, it became tough to live under the old law. And we also know that it's hard not to become tangled up in the things of this world because those things can bind you down and can weigh you down. And in the very next scripture, we see God turn the tables in Galatians 4, 4 through 5. And it starts off with our favorite word, but. That word right there means the game has changed. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. If you can go back to verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, when it was the right moment, like I said, God wasn't just sitting there cutting us out. He wasn't sitting on his hands. He was just waiting for the right time to send the Redeemer. Because he could have sent it any time. He said, there's a right time that I have to do it. And it was the fullness of time that he had started from before there was time. That date he assigned, they said, this is when I'm going to come and save my people. And he sent forth Jesus. He sent forth his son to save us. And what a turn of events. Because you look at Old Testament God. He wiped out the earth except for Noah's family because of all their sins. You look at Sodom and Gomorrah. He wiped them out for all their sins. He wanted to wipe out the people in the, in the wilderness like we just talked about. He's the God of judgment. But that's not his only quality. He's not just a big fist in the sky. Because as the Bible says, God is love. He is that agape love. And when man had done nothing, and God even told Israel, he said, your fathers in the wilderness began provoking me. For thousands of years, man has just provoked God and kept poking the bear and poking the bear and poking the bear. And he had every right to wipe us out. But instead of wiping us out, he says, you know what? I'm going to redeem those people. They messed up, but I'm going to give them yet another chance. Where once he had sent messengers to Lot saying, get your family out of the city. My judgment is coming. Now God is sending messengers to Mary and Joseph saying, you're going to bring forth a son. And his name is going to be called Jesus. And he is going to save these people from their sins. He said, I'm not wiping them out. I'm coming to save them this time. Because he was the judge at one point, and now he's going to be the Savior. <laughs> when Jesus calmed the storm, they said, what manner of man is this? That even the sea and the waves and the storms all obey him. Before the miracles, before the signs, before all the wonders, people could look at this child, they could look at this baby and say, what manner of child? Is this Isaiah said that a virgin will be with child and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. We know that means God with us. That's in Isaiah chapter 7. In Isaiah 9 and 6, it's a familiar Christmas scripture. He says this For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That name, Emmanuel, wasn't just symbolic. It wasn't just meant to mean something. It was literal. It was God with us. John said the word was with us. It was made flesh. It dwelt among us, and we beheld it. He said we didn't hear about it. We got to see it, and we got to touch the creator that was right before us. Awesome. 
The angels are telling Mary and Joseph, this is no ordinary baby. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior of the world. What we prophesied about for centuries upon centuries is now going to be coming out of your household. A baby that was born for a purpose. And you could say he was born to die. He was born to show God's love for us. 33 years he walked this earth. And he was born just so God could understand man. Job said there's no daysman betwixt us and God. There's no advocate. How can I go to God? And how can God understand what my complaints are and what I'm feeling? God doesn't know what it's like to be me, and I don't know what it's like to be God. But what we have now is that advocate, because what you go through, Jesus has already been through. All the suffering that you have, Jesus has already suffered. He faced temptation, and he stood face-to-face with the devil. I don't know if I've stood face-to-face with the devil. I've faced temptations, and I've not been perfect. I'll just let y'all know. But Jesus stood face to face with the devil and was able to withstand him. 33 years he walked knowing that his role in this world was simply to be a sacrifice. To pay a debt that he had no, he had no part in. He was perfect. He was without blemish. But he paid that debt. He became a sacrifice for billions and billions of people who were not even alive yet. He knew his purpose. As the kids would say, he understood his assignment. In 1 John 3 and 16, it says, Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. He loves us so much that he laid down his life for us. Just picture the weight that was on him day after day after day. He was totally God and he was totally man. But he knew at one point, this is the day. This day I'm going to die because Jesus already knew everything. The Bible says that Jesus, when the disciples were with him and all the people were following, it says that he already knew who was going to leave him and who was going to stick with him. He already knew everything that was going to happen. And wait, and that day after day, he just knew that he was going to have to be a sacrifice. And all I can do is lift my hands and say, thank you, Jesus, for carrying that weight. Because I couldn't carry that weight. Us as a church together couldn't carry that weight. But there was that lamb, there was that perfect sacrifice who stood dumb before the shearer, who opened not his mouth and said, I'll do it. And I know, and I I, I can't judge y'all, but I know I personally am not worthy of that sacrifice. I have done nothing to warrant that sacrifice. Look look how he came down to the earth, and this was talked about in Sunday school as well. It should have been with fanfare and royal pomp and circumstances. There should have been horns blowing and carriages and, and gifts all around. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the old days, the longer the train, the more majesty, the more power, the more status, the more wealth you projected as a ruler. A long train is a statement. And just the train of God's robe filled up the whole temple. That should tell you how awesome and powerful and majestic that he is. <coughs> yeah, Jesus. He has wealth that we can't fathom because everything already belongs to him. Nothing belongs to us. It's all his. When they went to rebuild the the temple in in the book of Haggai, he said, in a little while I'll shake the heavens. And not only am I going to shake the heavens, I'll shake the earth, I'll shake the sea, I'll shake the dry land. But with God, there's always more. He said, you know what else? I'm going to start shaking the nations. And the desire of all the nations shall come. That means all the precious things that these nations hold dear are going to be brought to you, are going to be brought into this house. And he said, I will fill this house with glory because the gold is mine and the silver is mine. God is saying, don't y'all worry about filling it. He said, because everything I have, everything that y'all see around, it already belongs to me. Yet even though he has it all, he chose, it was his choice, he still chose to come in a lowly birth. Not to come as a king like he deserved with all the royal ceremony, but instead he was born in a manger in little old Bethlehem. And it's, Dwayne loves when I do this, I'm sorry, pastor, I'm trying to get better at that. It, it, it's been a minute since I've referenced the For Him song up here, but they have a Christmas one called A Strange Way to Save the World. And it was kind of written from the point of Joseph. It talks about why me, I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him 
with all the rulers in the world. Why in the stable filled with hay? Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. This is such a strange way to save the world. How can a child born in a manger inherit the throne of David and rule over the house of Jacob forever? Because before there was even time, God worked it all out. And how blessed are we to have a God that lowered himself that came down from heaven that took on a fleshly robe to be born, to be suffered, to die, to be that ransom for all of us. He didn't have to do it, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to take the stripes for me, but he did it for me, and he did it for my healing. He didn't have to take the crown of thorns and the embarrassment and the shame, but he did it for his children. He didn't need the nails through the hands. He didn't need the, the whippings and the side pierce, but he did it for us anyway. He could have called thousands. He could have called legions of angels down from heaven to defend him, to keep him from experience and all that. But instead, he endured it all. Jesus understood his purpose. Through his, for the suffering of one, redemption became available for all. Amen. That's right. And his birth truly was, as Thomas said, the greatest gift this world had ever seen. Because all like sheep, we had gone astray. And God laid our iniquities on Jesus. Even though we're the ones that mess up, he said, you're going to be the scapegoat. You're going to be the ransom. You're going to be the one that pays for everything. Like I said, he stood there like a sheep before the shearer, dumb. He didn't open his mouth. You read the Gospels, he was totally God, but he was also totally man. The flesh side, I believe, had some dread when it came time for the crucifixion. Because he said, if possible, let this cup pass before me. Amen. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then he went back and prayed again. He said, if this cup won't pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He knew what was ahead of him, and he took it on anyway. And without his birth, I don't know if we'd be here in church today. Everyone says, remember the reason for the season. And the church, we, as a church, we better recognize that that's the truth. We better recognize that his birth, what it meant for us, what kind of doors and opportunities it opened for us, because we read earlier in Galatians about the fullness of time and God sending his son. Imagine God waiting an extra 2,100 years to come down on this earth. Where would we be today? We'd be outside. We wouldn't be in the flock. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't experience the presence and the power of God. We'd be like all the other Gentiles as the heathens. That would be us. We'd have no shot at this thing. So that's why we need to worship and that's why we need to praise God for his birth, that he came down to be that ransom for us because that birth helped open the door for redemption. It's the reason you have the ability to sit on a pew today. And again, without that birth, that door is closed for us. But because he came down, the door is now wide open. And if he'd waited 2,100 years till I was gone, I wouldn't have the spirit of adoption. I wouldn't be able to be a part of the family. I couldn't call myself a joint heir with Christ. I couldn't cry Abba, Father. Th right. Imagine not being able to cry out to God. Come on. When you're in trouble, when you're in trials and turmoils, when things go wrong, who are you going to cry out for? Come on. When you're a kid, you go to mom and dad. When you're an adult, God help me. That's right. But if he had waited, you couldn't say God help me because right. you wouldn't even know him. That's right. You'd be like just everybody else. Yeah. And his birth also started the process of us being grafted in contrary to nature. When we begin the process of being able to, to be a part of that fold, and it allowed us to, to be able to call him as our shepherd. Like I said, from the beginning, God has always had a master plan. And if you read the whole book, you'll see the plan ensures that he has a bride at the end of time. From beginning to end, you go and study the whole book, you'll see his desire, his will is to have a bride, is to have the church with him. And his birth had a purpose <clears throat> because it started the ball rolling on the redemption process and it kept rolling from Calvary all the way to Pentecost and it's going to keep rolling until we hear that trumpet sound. And that separation between us and God, between man and God, was now removed. And that was symbol symbolized in, in the, the veil being torn. And you went from being able to enter God's presence once a year to now that we have the Holy Ghost, we can experience it 24-7. I experience it here at church. I've experienced going down the road and other places. And it's all because he was born and he came, he lived, and he died. He gave us that opportunity. And you don't have to be a part of a, a certain tribe anymore. 
in order to experience the presence of God. Because Moses and Aaron, all those cats, they had to be a specific group. But now it's available for everybody. Because the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's no Gentiles. There's no nothing. Because we're all one in Christ Jesus. And his birth helped start the adoption process. And now, like I said, now I could be a joint heir with Christ. But Jesus is not the only one that was born for a purpose. Each of us has something that God wants to do in our lives that God wants to use us for. And we have to be willing whatever it is. Remember Jesus said, not my will, but thy will. Mary got blindsided with this announcement. I mean, who, who wakes up one day and expects to hear this? You're about to have a baby. And she's like, I don't think that's possible. And they're like, nope. You're the one and only. You're the virgin birth. And by the way, it's the Messiah. It's a child of the Holy Ghost. It is the Savior of the world. You've got to raise him, Mary. You've got to love him. And you've got to watch that baby hang on the cross to die for your sins. Talk about coming out of left field. And how does Mary react? Luke 1 and 38. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She's saying, here I am, Lord. Use me for your will. We talked about last week being a yes man for God, and that's exactly what Mary was. And that's the same mentality we need to have. God, whatever you call me to do, here I am. God has purpose and he has plans for each of our lives. And we need to be willing vessels. Whatever you need, like I said, Lord, I'll do it. That's the mentality you got to have. Now, do we always mean that? And do we always follow through? Not always. But we have to change that about ourselves. Because if we want God to continue to use us and grow how he wants us to grow, we got to continue to say, yes, Lord, yes, I'll do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so God's will for us what his desire is, is for us to be saved. It's for us to come to repentance. His will isn't that we perish, but that his will is that everyone has eternal life with him. What's the whole duty of man? To fear God and keep his commandments. Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's our job to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's our job to serve us and to worship God. That's what that reasonable service means is that you serve us and that you worship God. And part of the reason we were created, part of the purpose that we have in this life is to be worshipers and praisers of God. Because our worship and our praise should be done freely. It's something that I should want to do. Not something that I have to be poked and prodded with to do. <coughs> Because Psalms 150 says, praise him on the instruments, praise him in a song, praise him in a dance. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. And sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get us to praise God. For whatever reason, I don't understand. As Thomas said it before, is he not worthy of our praise? Is it too difficult to lift up your hands? Is it too difficult to clap? Is it too difficult to say, Lord, I love you? Lord, I thank you? What is so hard about offering up praise and worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I don't understand it. We've got to get past that in the flesh, and you've got to keep your hands, keep holy hands lifted up everywhere is what Paul said. Now, my toes may or may not have got stepped on in preparing this. Like the pastor always says, this hits us before it hits y'all. Now, you know, I coach basketball, and I get fired up at games. I'll yell. I'll clap. I'm walking back and forth. I'm getting 15,000, 20,000 steps a day in there at the basketball games. They're like, Coach, you want a seat? I said, you know, I'm not going to use it. And I get intense. I've broken markers. I've gotten a technical. It's <laughs> one of my... Friends I grew up with, uh, she came to the game. She said, I had no idea you had that inside of you. I was like, well, it's basketball. It's different. I didn't know it until last year. 
But when I started having to put ice on my toes is when you start thinking about, do I put that same intensity to my service to God? Do I put that same intensity to my worship for God? Because we're not offering him our best praise and our best worship. What are we really offering him? Do you think he wants a half-done sacrifice? Go find out what God did with people who offered up improper sacrifice. Saul lost his household. Okay, God does not want an empty or a halfway done sacrifice. And we all get excited. I know y'all get excited about stuff out in the world. You'll clap your hands. You'll get your hands up. You'll, you'll scream. I've even done the Ric Flair, woo, you know, at a basketball game. <laughs> but when it comes to church, it's like it's a different atmosphere. We have a different mindset. And it should be the complete opposite. Instead of getting excited out there, we should get excited every time that we come in here. What's there, what about church doesn't excite you when you come inside? And if you're going to offer up those things outside of church, then those things become common to you. And what you're telling God is, I'll offer up common praise to the world, but I can't even offer you up my common praise in church. I'm not even talking about offering up extraordinary praise. Like he talked about David dancing with all his might till his clothes was falling off. Come on. I'm talking about clapping your hands, singing, lifting your arms up. Amen. People go to concerts, they'll sing all day long. <laughs> I know sometimes, and, it, and it's sad, you know, we'll give the Lord a hand clap of praise after we finish reading off the, the names on the cancer list. And you'll have people sitting there. People can't even lift their hands up. They can't even muster a clap. And if there was ever a time to start praising them for not seeing your name on there, it's right now because we've seen how fast things can change. So if you want praise them now in the good times when you're not on the list, don't go bother talking to them when you find yourself on there. <laughs> we just sang, oh, come let us adore him. For he alone is worthy. He should get all of our best praise. I shouldn't prioritize doing my best for the Lord. I should be prioritizing giving up my best for him. Because he gave me a gift. That's the least I could do. Now I know my righteousness is filthy rags. And, and I may have told this before. But we offer up that stuff. We offer up praise unto him. It's not pretty. It's ugly. Does it even compare to what he did? No. But it's like you look at our Christmas tree and stuff mom has. There's some ugly, ugly ornaments on there <laughs> that we've made in Sunday school that we've made in school. And I'm like, why in the world would you want to keep these? She's like, because my kids made these. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but then Miles draws me a picture. I've got it sitting in front of my TV. I'm like, I understand it now. And it's not pretty to God. It doesn't compare to what he gives us, but it's beautiful to him. So I've got to do better. I've got to get my hands up. I've got to clap. I've got to move around. I've got to intensify my worship. And everybody here needs to intensify their worship. Because if you don't worship God now, you may find yourself on the outside. Because he said, if, if they don't praise me, the stones will cry out. And he ain't talking about the physical rocks, although he has the power to make that happen. He's talking about people who you don't see as being able to be saved. Keep your seat in the church, as Brother Jerry says. Because if you don't praise him, somebody else will. We've seen people leave the church. And we've seen people who ain't been in church in a long time come in and fill those seats. So don't think your seat's safe if you're just sitting there and you can't offer up 30 seconds of praise. If you can't praise God, why are you even here? Like I said earlier, everything is God's and everything that we have. And the Bible even talks about how our bodies, you know, we're, we're temples and, and temples of the Holy Ghost. But our bodies are not even our own. This flesh that causes us so much trouble, it's on, it's on loan to us. It's been given to us because he purchased it all. He paid the bill for the spirit that goes inside, the Holy Ghost that goes inside, and he paid for the body as well. The breath you have in there, the food you eat, the clothing, the word, the Holy Ghost, Everything you see around you. We talk about we work, we make stuff, we do all this. Well, nothing's possible without God. If he hadn't created it, you wouldn't have anything to begin with. So everything you have is because of him. Is that not worthy enough of your worship?
Prayer is another part of our purpose in life. That's communication with God. And communication with God is necessary. Is prayer a top priority for you every day? How often are you talking one-on-one with God? What is man that he is mindful of us? What is man that God desires to speak with us? God, the creator of heaven and earth, desires to speak with me and you on a daily basis. How do I fit into that, that pay scale? I'm this little. He's this. But yet he still wants to talk to me. The Bible says God spoke to Moses face to face as a man would with his friends. Is Moses any better than us? Is Moses any different than us? If Moses can do it, I can do it. Jesus said men ought always to pray. That men ought always to communicate with God. It was preached last week. Five minute prayers ain't going to cut it. If you can't find time to pray, you better make time to pray. Because when times get tough and you need to get a prayer through, you may not have the juice to get it up there. It may, it may get lost between here and God here and in his holy temple. You've got to have a little booster. You've got to have that power built up to where you can get it sent up into heaven. And God sees everything. He knows how we live our lives. He he. He knows what we do day to day. He knows our schedule. And at some point during your day, there is always time to pray. There's always time to talk to God. And it just may mean come, cutting out some of the things that the flesh wants you to do. If you can watch TV and, and TikTok and argue on Facebook all day, you can find time to pray. And if he sees that we have time to pray and we don't capitalize on it, how do you think that makes him feel? Because the time that we have is a gift from God. And if we're not using it properly, we're squandering our gift. And we talked at length about the talents. You waste your talents, he's going to take it and give it to someone else. People ask, how did your papa get so close to God? Because he set multiple, I mean multiple hours a day aside just to pray every day. He got up early, and then he did it in the evenings. And he did it just to pray for each of y'all. And unless you actually saw it in action, it's tough to understand. I know Nana saw it a a whole lot. It was a long, long prayer. And then we had separate prayers when, you know, we'd get together as family. Everybody hold hands. We'd say the Lord's Prayer. And Papa would say stuff at the end. And I remember Damon talked about it as a kid. He said, I'd just sit there. And I'd start looking up at the sky. He said, because Dad, and name would pop in Dad's head. And before you know it, he'd already prayed for half the county before we went to bed. But the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent means a mighty or powerful. How can we have mighty prayers with a weak prayer life? You're not going to have a mighty prayer. You're not, like I said, you're not going to be able to reach him into his holy temple unless you have a mighty prayer life. <clears throat> Jesus says greater works will you do than I do. That's a big statement because Jesus did a lot of stuff. It's recorded in there. He says, I reckon there's not enough books in the world that can contain all the acts that Jesus did. And Jesus said, you're going to do greater works than I do. And I'm 31. Jesus was already a year into his ministry at this time, and I'm starting to compare our resumes. He's got me beat a little bit. He's edged me out that much. But I've got the Holy Ghost. I've told you I've had since like seventh grade, 16, 17, 18 years, however long ago that was. I should be doing works. I've got the power that's inside, but I'm not using it properly. Part of who I'm supposed to be is someone who's out there doing the works. Because Jesus said these signs shall follow them that believe. Not that it's going to be an attack on bonus or all this stuff. He's like, if you're a believer, if you're a follower after me, these signs are going to follow. It's like a train. It's following right behind me. Wherever I go, these things should be following. I should be like Peter. I'm a big old boy. I have a big old shadow. I should be healing lots of people, Amen. but not as far as I know, nobody's gotten healed. The past few weeks, I should have been able to go and lay hands on Sister Kay said, be healed. I should have been able to pray for Sister Penny, Brother Jerry. I should be able to go to Princeton or wherever the Kennedys live and lay hands on Brother Jay and say, I don't have any silver, I don't have any gold, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, such that I had given unto thee, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I should be able to do those things by now, but as y'all can look around, None of those things have happened. And that tells me I'm not completely fulfilling my purpose 
of what God wants me to do. I have to do more on my end of the deal. <clears throat> and I'm starting to close here. Musicians, if y'all want to come on up. You need to pray. You need to study the word. You need to fast. You need to continue going beyond what you're doing. I have to go beyond what I'm doing right now. You have to continue to go on beyond what you're doing right now. Well, where can I find the answers of how I go beyond? It's in the word of God. He, in his infinite plan, he gave us the blueprint of everything we need. He gave us all the answers that we could ever ask for. It's in his word. Anything that you're going through, it's already in the Bible. Someone in there has already experienced it, whether it's betrayal, loss, heartache, finances, whatever it may be, someone has already experienced that in the Bible. Any answer that you need is already in there. So you've got to study the Word. You've got to delve into it, not just read it, but dive into it. If you want to read it in a year, that's fine. But don't just read it to say, I've read it. One of the best things that we ever did in an adult Bible study, Dwayne broke us up into groups. He said, read these parables, get together, discuss what, what you think they mean. Five, six scriptures. And we spent almost two hours discussing what those things. But we were studying in the Word. We didn't read five or six chapters. We just delved into what these verses meant. And each and every person saw something a little bit different. Because in the Bible, every time you read it, you're going to find something new. So you may not finish the Bible in a year, but if you're making an earnest effort to study, you're going to make improvement. Because if you're just reading to say you read it, you're not going to understand anything. I probably told you all before when I, was, when I graduated high school in the summer, I said, I'm going to read the book of Acts in a day. And I did. And the only thing I got out of it was that Paul likes talking about a shipwreck. I learned nothing else. Nothing else was edified in me. But when Thomas broke it down for 62 weeks or whatever over COVID, and we studied it out in depth, a lot more things were opened up. You've got to study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the work of God. And then another purpose, you've got to be the light of the world. You've got to be a witness. You've got to go and tell everybody about Jesus. Get yourself converted. Make sure you're good to go. And then go spread the gospel. Go tell people. How to be saved. What did Paul do? He got a sight back and immediately started preaching Jesus. Did he know all the intricacies of oneness and, and all that stuff? I don't think he did. Because he had to go in Arabia with the Lord. He had to sit underneath the apostles for a year or two. He had to be taught. He knew all the scriptures to begin with. But he had to have the revelation. He had to have, know everything about Jesus. And once he learned that, look how good of a preacher he was. Look how good of an apostle that he was. So you've got to be a light and a witness to the world. So Jesus had a purpose in this world. He came to be a light. He came to be a witness. Lots and lots of purposes. But he came to save our souls. And from day one till he hung on the cross, till even now, he's still fulfilling that purpose and making sure that we're saved and making sure that we have a home in heaven. Because he says, I've gone to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And then I'm coming back for you. So if you want to experience that, you've got to fulfill the purpose that you were born for in your life. Because if you don't fulfill that purpose, you're not going to experience what he's got. And that ain't me saying that. That's the word of God. So if you want to experience that purpose, if you want to pick up the slack where you messed up, because I know where my faults are. Y'all know where your faults are. We ain't fooling anybody, and you ain't fooling God because he's seen everything that we do. He knows everything that we've done. But come to the altar right here. And I ain't talking about, I ain't knocking people to pray at your seats or, or anything like that. But I was talking about things that have become common to you. If you prayed in the same spot for 15 or 20 years, take a step out. Do something a little bit different. Come out of your comfort zone because if you're still in that same spot for 10 or 20 years, that means you ain't doing something right. You're spinning your tires. And so maybe it just takes showing God, God, I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone. Right, yes. God doesn't ask me anything to do. Well, he's not, if someone ain't going to leave the home, if someone ain't going to do something, he ain't going to ask you to do it. Elisha and Elijah, Elijah said, let me go with you. 
And he ended up slaying the ox and he ended up doing everything. He left everything behind. He left everything that he knew was comfortable. The disciples, all Jesus said was, follow me. They gave up all their lives. Everything they knew, everything they were comfortable with, they gave it up for him. So if you truly want to fulfill your purpose today, come to the altar. Step out of your comfort zone. Offer up some extraordinary praise unto God. If you don't clap, if you don't lift your hand, if you don't sing out, if you don't shout, if you don't do any of those things, today is the day for you to fulfill your purpose. Pastor.